If you ever hear opposition to gender ideology, either they will be labelled far-right Christian or a TERF. And a TERF is a feminist who believes in biology and doesn't think you can choose to be a woman. Perhaps you'll be labelled as a Christian TERF, the ultimate in insults. But what you'll never hear the media and commentators talk about is what Muslims say about gender ideology and radical sexuality being targeted in schools and at their families. But they've got a strong opinion, and it's very similar to yours. Let's check it out. So I was sent this presentation recently by a friend who's Muslim, and Sheikh Dr. Yasser Qadi completed an MA in Islamic Theology from the College of Dawa, I think is how you say it, he then completed an MA, a Master's in Philosophy, and a PhD from Yale University. And uh, Sheikh Yasser is currently the Dean of the Islamic Seminary of America and Resident Scholar of the East Plano Islamic Center, which is in Texas. Now, I want to play some excerpts from his recent message, uh, starting with a slightly longer segment as he sets up the basis for their opposition to gender ideology. But it's it's very well expressed and argued. Have a watch. Dear Muslims, we live in interesting times. In this land of ours, if a teenager, a young man or woman, 16, 17, 18 years old, 17 years old, if they wish to get a tattoo, a permanent ink on their body, the law will say, that's not allowed, you're too young to get a tattoo. If a 20-year-old, now he's above the age of 18, he wants to purchase beer, the law will say, you're too young, you cannot drink beer. In fact, if any minor wants to purchase nicotine, cigarettes, they too will be told this is not allowed. If a young man or woman below the age of 18 goes to the doctor, says, I want cosmetic surgery, I want to change my body, look more handsome, more beautiful, the law will say, society will say, parents will say, rightfully so, you're too young to make this decision. All of this is valid and good. Because that's the role of society, of parents, of law. But what we are seeing now is something very strange. In the same land where a 17-year-old cannot purchase cigarettes, if that same child comes and says, Oh, I think I have been born into the wrong body. I think my gender has been assigned by God incorrectly. I think that I want to shift to another gender and they go to the doctor not for tattoo ink not for cosmetic surgery to look more handsome and beautiful but to self mutilate themselves to cut off their natural organs to amputate that which makes them quintessentially male or female at the same age that they cannot purchase a packet of cigarettes if they go to the doctor and say i want to block the natural progression of puberty. I want to take abnormal, atypical drugs so that I don't develop and blossom into a young lady or I don't become a young man. The same society that doesn't allow a 17 year old to put ink on their hands is going to welcome and embrace. And in case the parents say, oh, hold on a sec, you're too young. In case the parents say, you're only 10, 15, 17, how can you make this decision? What we are seeing now is that terrifyingly, not yet fully, but in more and more cases, the law is siding with a child against the parents. Under the guise of what is called transgender rights, we are witnessing yet another assault against the social fabric of humanity. And if you know your Western history, this is not the first time these types of assaults have taken place. For the last 100 years, we have consistently been seeing one assault after another. Almost a century ago, after World War II, a movement arose. A movement arose that launched an attack on what it means to be quintessentially feminine. A movement arose that attacked the roles of men and women, that mocked true femininity, even if they called themselves feminists. And they mocked true masculinity. 
and they said men and women roles are all the same. This movement, by and large, considered itself to have achieved success. But that wasn't the end. After this movement finished, another movement arose. From the 60s onwards, a movement came, and this movement blatantly encouraged promiscuity outside of marriage. Embraced intimacy, not in the privacy of the bedroom of the husband and wife, but everywhere, nudity, fahisha, licentiousness became the norm. And this movement as well was wildly successful from their own paradigm. As we speak today, in a land where barely 100 years ago, this very land, less than 10% of people engaged in premarital intercourse, in this land now, over 95% of our men and women are engaging in premarital intercourse. Let that statistic sink in. Over 95% of society is engaging in premarital intercourse and it is not even considered to be something that one needs to hide. So that movement as well changed society altogether. As if that wasn't enough, yet another movement began. This one in our own lifetimes, those of us that are above the age of 35 or 40. From the 80s onwards, a new movement began. The same sex movement, the LGBTQ movement. And we saw a normalization, not only of promiscuity between a man and woman, but between the same genders as well. And that too was from its own paradigm, wildly successful. And the Supreme Court and others have passed the laws that they have passed. As if that wasn't enough, we now have to face yet another onslaught. But this one, in so many ways, is even more sinister. It is frankly unbelievable because it is negating not just theology, not just scripture, not just history. It is negating basic biology. It is negating a scientific fact that there are no two opinions about. And that is the male and female are two separate genders. All of mankind, forget mankind, all of mammals, forget mammals, the entire species of animals. The default is, yes, there are exceptions, the amoeba and whatnot, but the default is every single created object is in male and female. This is the default. And nobody could ever have imagined a time when even this basic fact of biology is being challenged. But here we are having to debate, is gender real or is it a social construct? By social construct, they mean a figment of the imagination created by uh, peoples and civilizations and societies. And it must be said, brothers and sisters, no matter how awkward this is, if you look at this trajectory where we are now, frankly, it was inevitable from the very beginning. Because if you're going to tinker with gender roles, which is what happened 100 years ago, if you're going to challenge gender norms, the inevitable end result, you will challenge gender itself. You will challenge gender and biological sex itself. And here we are having to teach our children such a basic fundamental fact, not just of the Quran, not just of history, but of biology, that the male is not like the female, that there are two genders, that there is something called dhakr, and there's something called untha, and these two are not the same. And brothers and sisters, even more terrifying than simply having to teach our children is the ever encroaching reality of legislation affecting even our family households. Yeah, it's very good teaching from Sheikh Qadi, isn't it? And very similar to what we would be saying as well. Um, just a couple of other short clips that I want to show of what he says. Um, and he talks about what will they do if it happens to their own children? What should be the response of parents? What will we do if one of our own children is brainwashed? What will we do if a seven-year-old in our own masjid stands up and says, I'm in a different gender? What will we do at that stage? That is why we need to understand from now what is happening and put up a fight within the remnant, within the strategies of the law and make sure that our rights to pass our faith, our rights to practice Islam freely, our rights to be normal human beings, frankly, are not taken away from us. Yeah, and he actually refers to a Christian case in the, teach, in the full teaching. He refers to a Christian case in Texas where the child is being transitioned against the wishes of the parents. And he says, 
Yes, it's a Christian family, but this could happen to any family. He then encourages the families that it's time to stand up and speak up. We are going to stand up and preach the truth no matter how bitter, no matter what the consequences are. This type of hedonism, this type of sensuality, this type of licentiousness and animalness, this type of foolishness, we need to stand up and preach loudly and clearly. Enough is enough. Yeah, it's uh, interesting that the media haven't talked about this. Um, he then um, briefly talks about the number of genders that you can choose from uh, and expresses concern about the messaging which is targeting children. Brothers and sisters, the claim that biological sex is a choice, it is not just factually incorrect. It is not just scientifically, patently false. It goes against the lived reality of every society known to mankind from the beginning of human history. The man is not like the woman. And yet, if you look at what our children are being taught, they are taught that you may choose your gender and you may change your mind every few days. One day you wake up and you're this, the other day you wake up, you're that. Oh, by the way, if you didn't know, it's not just two genders. I actually checked today to make sure I'm up to date because the list is updated every few weeks and months. I just checked one of their websites and I'm not exaggerating. 105 identities, genders and identities. 105 more flavors than Baskin Robbins. You wake up and you just change every day. I want to be this, I want to be that. And subhanAllah, it would be bad enough if it was just adults mutilating themselves and pretending to become a different gender. Yeah, well, of course, uh, as we know, some schools in New Zealand teach that there's 112 genders and 200 plus sexualities. Uh, finally, the Sheikh encourages families to ignore the labelling, the accusations of transphobia and being accused of hatred and violence. And once again, he argues and presents this very logically. Here we have to acknowledge one of the tactics, one of the dastardly tactics of this trend, and that is to accuse us of preaching hatred and violence. They've coined the term transphobia. If you dare don't agree with this sentiment, then you are somebody who's acknowledging, somebody who's embracing racism, somebody who's wanting to prove hatred. And this is completely untrue. They accuse us of bigotry and hatred and potentially calling for violence. But we respond back. Inventing terms, transphobia, doesn't change biological facts. We're telling you biological facts. Forget even scripture, you're not Muslim. Okay, forget even scripture. You can invent whatever term you want. We are speaking biological truths here. Also, disagreeing with a lifestyle does not mean you are preaching hatred. We need to say this loudly and clearly. Disagreeing with a lifestyle does not mean we are preaching hatred, much less violence. For centuries, we are saying we don't drink alcohol. Are we preaching hatred of all the people who drink beer, who drink alcohol? No, of course not. That's their business, they're doing it. We don't drink alcohol, allow us that freedom and right. Nobody invented the term alcohol phobia, Muslims are alcohol phobic, no. Our preaching of our morality does not mean we are preaching hatred, much less violence. That is your imagination. That is your false accusation. And it is nothing, for, there is nothing further from the truth. You have your lifestyle choices. Allow us to have our lifestyle choices as well. And we speak out against it, not only because we are believers in a higher power, but because we genuinely believe this is harmful, this is dangerous. If a young man or woman said, I want to cut my hand off, what would you say? If a young man or woman said, I want to cut my leg off, what would you say? We would come together and say, no, no, don't do this, it's wrong. Well then, if they want to cut their genitalia off, all of a sudden it becomes, it becomes sacred under law. It's the same principle. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very good teaching and uh, it's exactly what we would be saying. But the media won't tell you what Muslims think of gender ideology. I mean, have you seen this type of argument being presented? It seems to be the media motto is, don't ask, don't tell. But what is quickly evident is that Muslims are just as concerned about radical and extreme sexuality and gender ideology being targeted at our children and society as most other faiths. And in fact, most people without any stated faith also share the concerns. 
So when you're labelled a Christian phobic or a turf, ignore it. Know that when you argue for biology, you're on the right side of truth. And that's always the best side to be on. (laughs) 